Hello everyone. So first of all, can those who were not able to join confirm that they joined? Can you hear me? Okay. So can somebody tell me, did we start with the cellular biology yet? Did we explain this page? You guys are slow today. So I'm not sure if we did this or not. Okay, somebody says no. So cellular uh, cell cycle phases. The first thing to know about the cell cycle that the function of the cell cycle. The function of the cell cycle is to bring one cell, move it through the cell cycle, and to make duplicate of cells, two cells. So to do that, um, to do that, we have to go through all of the phases of the cell cycle, which include the G1 phase, in which we will have preparation and uh, creating of enough amount of a nucleic acid to for the DNA synthesis. During the S phase, we have the process of replication occurring. And during the G2 phase, we have the process of a proofreading occurring. During mitosis, if we, we have like one cell, it has a nucleus inside of it, of course, the alleles are going to go to the sides, okay? So it, it is going to be uh, detached from each other and the, everyone is going to go to the side. During cytokinesis, these two structures are going to be separated together, creating totally two new different cells, okay? So, we have all of these phases of the cell cycle. All of the phases of the cell cycle together are called interphase when they do not include the M phase. They write, uh, Checkpoints control transition between phases of the cell cycle. This process is regulated by cyclins and cyclin-dependent kinases and tumor suppressors. To be fair with you guys, uh, one of my students got the 2022 version of the book, so I'm going to explain this page from it. Uh, let me just uh, try to forward it. Here you go. Okay, so they write. They write something as follows. Regarding this page, there is a few things that you need to appreciate and understand. They say, uh, first of all, there is a three things that control the cell cycle. What are they? They are the cyclin, the cyclin-dependent kinases, and the tumor suppressors, okay? Tumor suppressors, uh, like the B53, the RB, this stuff. So they write here that um, M phase, which is the so shortest phase of the cell cycle, includes the mitosis. What is mitosis? I told you, when we have a cell, the mitosis is when the nucleic acid material gets divided and it gets separated into the edges or the periphery of the nucleus of the cell. Regardless, no division yet. Division is cytokinesis. So it contains something called the brophase, brometaphase, metaphase, and anaphase and telophase. These ones you do not have to know now, but you will need to know in the near future when we start discussing the uh, reproductive um, chapter in the book. Okay? So, they write, cyclin dependent kinases. The idea about cyclin and the idea about cyclin dependent kinase with the cyclin um, is the following. To be able to speak about these three, the regulator of the cell cycle, first of all, we need to understand the cell cycle. So, as I told you, it starts with the G1 phase, uh, G1 phase uh, I'm sorry, G1 phase. It goes to the S phase, 
and then go to the G2 phase. G1 phase, we were preparing for the replication. S phase for the replication itself. S, uh, G2 phase is for the proofreading. Okay. Okay. So the next thing we have is the different cell types. We have permanent cells, we have stable cells, and we have label cells. If we are speaking about the permanent cells, we have to understand one thing. Permanent cells are stuck and they stay at the um, G0 phase, okay? They cannot move it from the G0 phase to any other phase of the cell cycle. So they remain at the G0 phase. They cannot divide, they cannot do anything. The three tissue, uh, sorry, the tissues that are unable to divide include the neurons and the striated muscles, which is both a skeletal and cardiac muscle. Also, they write here RBC, but to be more, more exact, it's mature RBCs. Why? Because they don't have a nucleus. They don't have a nucleus. They cannot divide. Stable cells, also known as equosian cells, are normally a G0 phase. But when it's needed, they can enter the G1 phase and go inside of the cell cycle to divide. So they write that they enter the G1 phase from the G0 phase when stimulated. Okay? Examples on it include hepatocyte, lymphocyte, proximal convoluted tubular cells, and periosteal cells. So yeah, stable cells. Uh, by the way, guys, if I have a liver and I cut it from here and I just remove this portion, what will happen to the liver after six months, let's say? Regrow, absolutely. Because it's going to jump from the G0 phase to the G1 phase. There are some types of cells that never exit the, uh, sorry, never enter the G0 phase. So they are always dividing. These cells are known as stem cells, okay? So these stem cells can be existing in the bone marrow, gut epithelium, especially in the crypt, crypt, they like to ask about this, the crypt, the skin, the basal layer of the skin, striatum basale, hair follicles, and germ cells like spermatozoa and oocyte. So, they write, they divide rapidly with short G1 phase. So they will be the most likely to be affected in case of chemotherapy, which can lead to bone marrow suppression, diarrhea because of gut epithelium degradation, um, like photo, photo, uh, photosensitivity and dermatitis because of the skin affection, loss of hair because of hair follicle destruction, and infertility because of the germ cell destruction during chemotherapy. Okay, so this is the cell cycle. So let's understand the relationship between the B53, the tumor suppressor gene, with the cell cycle. The B53 normally leads to production of something called B21. So B21 goes and inhibits the cyclin-dependent kinase complex from binding to the retinoblastoma. Guys, it's a cyclin-dependent kinase. Kinase, what is the function of kinase? Well, the function of kinase is phosphorylation. Yep. So it phosphorylates the retinoblastoma gene. When it phosphorylated, as you can see, it detaches it from the elongation factor too. So when it's phosphorylated, it gets it uh, like separated from the elongation factor too. And let's say the retinoblastoma gene is not existing, so you don't have the B21. You don't have the inhibition of this process, so this process will occur. So you will have phosphorylation of the retinoblastoma gene, which is going to remove the retinoblastoma gene. And now the elongation factor two is going to go and bind to the S phase. So you are going to have now synthesis of the DNA. Okay. Well, that means when the B53 is not here, we have really rapid synthesis of the DNA. Is this is a good thing or a bad thing? Bad, because this is how cancer happens. Good. So, if we say that B53 is working, it's going to block this step by B21, binding to the cyclin-dependent kinase cycling complex, which will lead to prevention of phosphorylation, which means the retinoblastoma gene will always be binding to the elongation factor 2, and thus less transcription, 
which means less cancer. Also, the B53 help in the inhibition of the BCL2 and BCLXL. What was the function of the BCL2? It had the function. Well, the function was preventing the release of the cytochrome C from the mitochondria, which normally led to activation of the caspases, okay? So the B53 inhibit the BCL2 and BCL, which can actually induce apoptosis, okay? So in that case, you will have more uh, caspase activation. You cannot protect against the backs and the back uh, pro-apoptoic genes, which will lead to apoptosis. Okay, if the person does not have B53, will he have apoptosis? No apoptosis, correct. So if he has no apoptosis, that means that he will have hyperproliferation and again, cancer. Good. So B53. The B53 um, has the following things to, to appreciate. First of all, DNA damage. So the DNA damage can destroy the B53, also a disease called Lefremani syndrome, which had the sablum pneumonic, if you remember, sarcoma, breast cancer, lung cancer, and adrenal cancer. It's a loss of functional mutation of the tumor suppressor gene, B53. Also the HPV, the carcinogen type, can inhibit the B53. Now that we know the cell types and we know what happens exactly here, we can speak about the regulator of the cell cycle. The first one, the cycling dependent kinase. So the cycling dependent kinase, it's uh, this guy, yeah? It's normally uh, inactive when it's not bound to the cycling. So for the sake of getting him active, you need the cycling, okay? Which as you can see here, it's binding to it. So now, the cycline, cycline dependent kinase complex. So it's together the cycline and the CDK together. So the cycline are phase specific regulatory proteins which work at an exact step in the cell cycle that activates the cycline dependent kinase when stimulated by growth factor. The cycline dependent kinase complex can, can then phosphorylate other proteins, like for example, the retinoblastoma, which we saw here. So when they phosphorylate it, they coordinate the cell cycle progression. So if it was phosphorylated, will we have cell cycle progression? Yes or no? If we phosphorylate the retinoblastoma. Will we have progression of the cell cycle? The answer is yes, absolutely. So this complex must be activated or inactivated at the appropriate times for the cell cycle to progress. So tumor suppressor genes. The B53 lead to induction of the B21, which lead to inhibition of the CDK um, to cycling complex, which lead to hypophosphorylation. Yeah? If I have hypophosphorylation, there is going to be less G1 to S phase progression. Why? Because less elongation factor 2. The mutation in this tumor suppressor, suppressor gene um, can lead to unrestrained cell division, which is known as Lefremani syndrome, which has the sabla, which is sarcoma, breast cancer, lung cancer, and adrenal cancer. A growth factor can bind to a growth factor can bind to the tyrosine kinase receptor, which help the transition from the G1 phase to the S phase. And these are examples of these growth factors: insulin, platelet-derived growth factor, retrobotin. And finally, we have the EGF. Okay. So, few moments here. After this page, this is just general principle of the cell cycle. Now, I would like to jump forward. And that, like, this is the only concept I wanted to explain from biochem for today. I will be jumping forward a little bit. And going back to GIT, I want to finish the pharmacology chapter with you. So this is my second goal for today. The first goal was to do that base. The second goal is to do uh, this um, pharmacology thing. And if we have time, I have a third goal, but that is just in case if we have an extra time. 
So acid separation therapy. We have vagus. Remember, vagus can stimulate the acetylcholine, which can work at the M3 receptor, which can lead to activation of the GQ. Why M3 GQ? Because remember, we draw the M, so M1 will be Q. M2 will be I, GI. M3 will be Q again. So here M3, so that will be GQ, yes? Okay, so M3 can lead to activation of the GQ, which can lead to activation of the secondary messenger, which can lead to AT base activation, which lead to more hydrogen to be secreted in the lumen, which then is going to bind to the chloride, and that will create HCl, yes? Okay. So, also vagus can lead to promotion of the gastrin-releasing peptide, which work on the G cells and can produce gastrin, the G cells. Gastrin, remember, it had two pathways to work at. The first one, it used to work directly using the CCK B, B receptor, which is not a real CCK receptor. Uh, that activates the GQ, which also lead to more hydrogen in the lumen. But the more potent way was using the enterochromaffin-like cell. The enterochromaffin-like cell produces histamine, which can lead to more H2 receptor activation, not H1. You remember, you, to dine, you need two people, yeah? So dine, stomach, um, and the drugs that works as an H2 blocker ends with the word dine. Okay, so that will lead to H2 receptor activation will lead to GS, which lead to activation of cyclic AMB, which also lead to ATBase activation, which lead to more hydrogen outside. Okay, the next one is somatostatin, Dr. House, if you remember, and the prostaglandins. Both of them inhibit the secretion by working at GI. Well, let's try to make a note about this. What will be more stronger, inhibiting the H2 receptor or inhibiting the ATBase bump itself. The ATBase, absolutely, because it's going to stop the function of all of the other receptors, yeah? So, do we have a drug who actually work here? Yes, BBI. Proton bumps inhibitor and has it also work locally. Okay, one more thing to know about. When you get hydrogen outside of your body, you are going to get something interesting. You are going to get something called the alkaline tide. What is this alkaline tide? When you get hydrogen outside of your body, the carbonic anhydrase inside of your parietal cells of your stomach is going to start working extra. Why? To make you more hydrogen, yeah? So in the process, he will make you a lot of bicarb, which is going to be reabsorbed, and that will increase the alkalinity of your blood. During meals, or vomiting. Okay. Sacral fate bismuth, it leads to a mechanical cover that prevents um, ulcers. Mesobristol is a prostaglandin analog, basically, that also protect against the damage to the stomach wall. Okay. Let's start with H2 blocker. The H2 blocker, as I told you, you dine with two, Table for two, remember H2. Take H2 before you dine. Yes, simatidine, thamotidine, nazatidine. The mechanism, they have a reversible blockade of the H2 receptor, which decreases the hydrogen secretion by the barita cells. So it can be used for a clerical ulcer disease, gastritis, mild esophageal reflux as well. So it has some side effects though. Some side effects that it has include the following. The first one, and it, actually the most important, is simatidine. is a potent inhibitor of the cytochrome B450. So multi-drug interaction, which means what happens when you uh, decrease the B4, uh, cytochrome B450 activation? You will increase, increase the concentration of all of the other drugs. What about if you stimulate the cytochrome B450, you are going to inhibit, inhibit all of the other drugs. It also can have an antiandrogenic effect, which is the thing they ask about, due to prolactin release. 
which can lead to gynecomastia, impotence, which is erection, inability to get erection, and decreased libido in males. Um, okay, so all of this is because of the function of the prolactin. It can cross the blood-brain barrier, which can lead to confusion, dizziness, and headache if it makes it to the brain. And it can go through the placenta, which means you should not give it to a pregnant lady. Cimetidine decreases renal excretion of creatinine. Um, other H2, which can lead to a fakely increased creatinine, which is a really interesting sign because you it can mistakenly make you think that the patient has renal failure when he does not. Other H2 bloker are relatively free of these side effects. So to make it simple, do not use cimetidine in a practice. Is it used in a practice? The answer, to be real with you, we don't use these drugs as much. There was a drug back in the time called dranitidine. It used, it used to be used a lot, but they stopped it as well because of some risk of esophageal cancer they found. Okay. So famotidine and nizotidine, on the other hand, are free of side effects. So, protons pump inhibitor. Omeprazole, lanoprazole, brazole, 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 brazole. All of them ends with a brazole. So for the step one, you don't have to know the difference between them. For step two, you need to know a little bit, but yeah, for now, you don't need. The mechanism, it irreversibly inhibits the bump. Okay, the main bump. So... Inhibit the hydrogen potassium ATPase in the stomach parietal cells. Well, before we continue, which one will be stronger, H2 blocker or BBI? What will have more function? BBI, absolutely. Yep. Uh, clinical use for peptic ulcer disease, okay, for gastritis and esophageal reflux. All of these are because they decrease the acid secretion. Zuliger Elson syndrome, which was what was that? Can somebody remind me what was that? Yes, it's a gastrinoma, which will lead to distal ulcer diseases. Also, component of therapy of H. pylori. Remember, in H. pylori, we had a triple and a quadruple therapy. The triple therapy was for, uh, no, for VI boma, we don't use this. For VI boma, we would like to use a, uh, an octeriotide, okay? So, again, for protein bumps inhibitor, um, we use it for the triple therapy. What is triple therapy made out of? Amoxicillin, clarithromycin, and BBI. So, that's the triple therapy. What about the quadruple therapy? Quadruple therapy is made out of metronidazole. Uh, metronidazole, let me remember. Metro, ah, uh, BBI again. BBI, metronidazole, sacrolfate, which is like protector of the surfaces. And you can use also amoxicillin. Why it was invented? It was invented because there was a huge risk of resistance to the clarithromycin. So all of the H. pylori these days are not all, but a lot of regions actually have resistance to the clarithromycin which make the triple therapy quite useless. So you must use a quadruple therapy. Okay. Which cancer can be treated with a triple therapy or a quadruple therapy? Which cancer? Excellent. Malt lymphoma. I was asking uh, which cancer can be treated with a triple therapy and the cancer that can be treated with a Triple therapy is malt lymphoma, okay? Because it's caused by the H. pylori and it was the only cancer that is reversible. So they write here, um, they mention the following. Adverse effect of this, oh yeah, we also can use them for a stress ulcer prophylaxis. Um, who gets a stress ulcer? For example, somebody in the ICU, okay? They can get a stress ulcer, so you would like to give them BBI. Adverse effect, increased risk of C. diff infection because of manipulation of the pH of the intestine, pneumonia, and interstitial nephritis. Interstitial nephritis will have what in the urine?
Not fatty casts, no. Some type of cast, but not fatty. The residual. Ozinophilic cast, white blood cells cast, white blood cells. Not the brown. Brown was for acute tubular necrosis. Acute interstitial nephritis will be white blood cell cast, the eosinophils. Okay? Vitamin B12 malabsorption can occur as well. And also they write here, decrease in the serum magnesium and calcium absorption, which potentially lead to increased risk of fracture, especially in the old people. So in the old people, decrease in the serum magnesium and calcium will increase the risk of a fracture. So you need to be really careful, especially uh, in the older population when you prescribe such medication. And uh, you need to give them a higher, a little bit of a higher dose of calcium because they already have less absorption of it. Okay? Antacids. So the antacids, they affect the absorption by availability. It can affect the absorption by availability or urinary excretion of other drug by alternating the gastric and the urine BH, and sometimes by delaying the gastric emptying. Basically, these antacids are substances that you consume and they like to act only locally in their place. They don't bind to receptors, they just act locally. So all of them lead to hypokalemia. Overuse can cause the following problems. So we have aluminum hydrochloride and we have magnesium hydrochloride and we have calcium carbonate. When you use aluminum hydrochloride, actually, what do we do? Just for the sake of, uh, oh, I will tell you this later. Aluminum uh, hydroxide, sorry, lead to constipation. Magnesium hydroxide lead to diarrhea. So what do we do? We give both of them together. So you will not have diarrhea. You will not have constipation. Just remember, you are an MD. Yes. So magnesium lead to diarrhea. Aluminum hydroxide, constipation, hypophosphatemia which lead to osteodystrophy. Also, the, the hypokalemia can lead to problem in your muscles, which can lead to proximal muscle weakness and even seizures. I mean the hypokalemia, because as we said, all of them cause that. The next thing is magnesium hydroxide, which lead to diarrhea, hyporeflexia, hypotension, and cardiac arrest because of the hypokalemia. Calcium carbonate, can lead to hypercalcemia, obviously, which is milk alkaline syndrome. What is the, why they call it milk alkaline syndrome? People back in the time, when they used to have ulcers, they used to drink milk because they make it make them like feel better. It was a really bad idea actually because milk contains what in it? it contains proteins, which is stimulate the stomach to secrete more acid. So, yep, it will lead to rebound acid increase, which will make it even more painful. So initially, the pain will go away. But then the pain will become even worse because the acid will be secreted more. It can, calcium, so I will tell you, it's for temporary relief of the pain. That's why antacids are over the counter. While, which means like the patient just go and he's like, oh, I have a stomach ache. Let me take some antacids to relieve the pain for five minutes. After they take it, after food for five minutes, will come back so um so yeah that's why uh, these are not the best medication but they are available and you need to keep that in mind in addition do not consume them with <coughs> it can chelate which means what what chelation means it's like calcium can bind to another something and lead to this destruction yes what is the other something the drugs especially tetracycline okay now i remember my mistake my mistake was um, the triple therapy is made out of metronidazole, tetracycline, okay, bismuth sulfate, and BBI. Okay, I said something else here about tetracycline. I was wrong. It's tetracycline. So, oh yeah, oh yeah. So, calcium carbonate can also prevent the reabsorption of iron, which can lead to iron deficiency anemia. Good. So, the next point is about bismuth sacral fate. The mechanism, I told you, bosmos or sacral fate, they act locally, okay? They act locally. So they bind to the ulcer base, providing physical protection and allowing bicarbonate secretion to establish the BH uh, gradient in the mucus layer. So they just bind at the place where, uh, if we say that this is the membrane, this is the ulcer, they come, fill up the ulcer, and they create a physical protection of the area, okay? 
So sacred faith requires an acidic environment, uh, which is actually a good idea. Why? Because most people who have this problem, well, they are going to have the ulcer. So when they have increased acidity, it's going to block the area. It will work even better. We don't like to give it, regardless of the fact that it's given with the quadruple therapy, we don't like to give sacral faith. So bismos is given in, an, in a quadruple therapy. While sacral faith is not. Why? Because sacral faith requires acidic environment. Quadruple therapy contains BBI, protons bond inhibitor. What will happen to the acid of the stomach in case of use of BBI? It will be, no, less acid, less acid. That means the BH will go higher. Okay, so the acidity will go down. If the acidity go down, the sacrophate will not work. That's why we use basmus sulfate, not sacrophate, in case of ulcers. So, the clinical use increased the ulcer healing, and it can be used for traveler diarrhea. We don't know why, but it actually works. Uh, can somebody tell me, actually, um, in case of traveler diarrhea, what causes this traveler diarrhea? Do you remember from microbiology, which bacteria? Not cholera. Okay, it's E. coli, enterotoxogenic E. coli. Enterotoxogenic E. coli. That is correct. Okay, so we can use it for that. We don't know why, but it actually works. Busmos also uses uh, used in the quadruple therapy for H. pylori gastritis. But as we said, you can use Busmos. You cannot use sacrophate. Okay, the last one before the break. We have, mm, oh, misoprostol. Mesopristol mechanism is the prostaglandin's E1 analog. Okay. Uh, prostaglandin A1 analog, which increases the production and the secretion of gastric mucus barrier, which will protect you from the acid activity uh, of the HCL. And also it can decrease the acid production. How? Well, we said here. Prostaglandins can bind to the receptor, working in the GI, decreasing the cyclic AMB, which decreases the AT base function. So, clinical use. It's for the prevention of the NSAIDs-induced peptic ulcer, because what was the idea of NSAIDs? They inhibit the COX, which is cyclooxygenase, which decreases the prostaglandin. So if you give the prostaglandin, you will not get an ulcer with NSAIDs. Also used for off-label induction of labor. Let me uh, tell you a little bit about this. This is the cervix of the lady, and this is her uterus, okay? The cervix is made out of smooth muscles. So if you put the prostac... Uh, what is RA? I'm not sure what is RA. Um... Yeah, so it's possible actually, uh, yeah, so let's say somebody with rheumatoid arthritis, okay? You must give him insets. So you have to give him the insets. You can try like um, COX-2, which will also work. But let's say you are obligated to give him COX-1 inhibitor. So you can give him with that mesoprostol and he will not get the ulcer. Also, yes, absolutely. So also can be used as a ribbon, ribbon cervix. So the lady cervix, it's made out of smooth muscles. So when you put the prostaglandins in it, I mean, you put it in your finger and you put it on the cervix, um, what is going to happen to the uh, smooth muscles? It's going to relax. When it relaxes, that can lead to induction of the labor, which makes the baby goes out much more easily, okay? The adverse effect include diarrhea and it's contraindicated of child, uh, oh yeah, child be, uh, child-bearing potential because it's uh, uh, it can lead to abortion why i just told you guys we use it to induce the labor because it relaxes the cervix and make it super big so if the lady is pregnant and you give it to her alive or dead the child will go out okay okay good so see you guys in 10 minutes yes so octeriotide is a somatostatin analog which means that it blocks the somato uh, tropin or growth hormone activity. It inhibits the secretion of various sublinkinic vasodilatory hormones. Okay, this is actually super important. Why? Because basically we are speaking that 
we will have an inhibition of so many things. So remember, we could use it for VI boma, for carcinoid, because it decreases the secretion of the serotonin of the uh, uh, VIB. Also in acromegaly, because it's an antagonist basically for the growth hormone. And finally, for the variceal bleeding, because of the vasoconstriction that it can lead to. Adverse effects include nausea, cramps, steatorrhea, because of the inhibition of so many stuff. And also, it can increase the risk of uh, cholelithiasis. Why? Because it inhibits cholecystokinin. What was the function of cholecystokinin, guys? What was the function of cholecystokinin? Contraction of the bladder. So if the bladder is not contracting, we'll, we'll have a problem, which is basically like um, stasis of the bladder, okay? The, I mean the gallbladder, which is a serious issue because it is going to lead to precipitation and eventually to gallstones. Okay, which inflammatory bowel disease do you know? And uh, which HLA is it associated with? Okay, B27, ulcerative colitis and the Crohn's. Absolutely correct. Okay, so there is a drug called sulfalazine, which is a combination of two drugs. So inside of this sulfalazine, we have two medications. The first one is called sulfabiridine, and the other one is called 5 amino salicylic acid. Okay, 5 amino salicylic acid, which is an anti inflammatory. Um, type of activity like aspirin. Remember, inside of aspirin, we had what? Acetylosalicylic acid, salicylic acid. And it's activated by the colonic bacteria, which is really good. Why? Because think about it. If it's activated only in the colon, it will lead to more side effects or less side effects. Less side effects. So it can be used to treat ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease because they decrease the inflammation and also prevent the bacteria from leading an infection there, okay? So they have some non-specific side effects, but one of the important ones is the sulfur allergy and the reversible oligospermia, which is a decreased amount of the sperms. Lubiramide. Lubiramide is a drug that is really, really famous these days. And the idea of lubiramide, that it's an opioid agonist. People who consume opioid always have a complaint about their GI. Which complaint do drug addicts have about GI? Not only drug addicts, actually. Also people like who have cancer, you know. Uh, so they have cancer and they must take this medication for the pain. Uh, I mean the opioid. They keep complaining about one thing. What was that one thing? Constipation. So... Because of that, like they were like, oh, so a side effect of this opioid is constipation. So somebody with watery diarrhea, of course, you will not give it in, in bloody diarrhea. If the patient has a watery diarrhea, you can give him an opioid and that will reduce the diarrhea. But we are afraid that to give him opioid, why? Because opioid is a drug of abuse. So instead of giving him opioid, we give a drug called lubiramide. Absolutely. So what is the difference between lobiramide and, well, general opioid? Well, lobiramide structure does not allow it to be absorbed, okay? So it cannot, lobiramide cannot be absorbed from the intestine. Because of that, if it cannot be absorbed from the intestine, uh, can it lead to crossing of the blood-brain barrier? No. Okay, if the answer is no, and you cannot cross the blood-brain barrier, can it be addictive? Yep, it cannot be addictive, that's it. So that's exactly uh, why we use this one. Okay, so let's take a look. No addictive, um, yep, yep, no effect. Libiramide, it's an agonist of the mu receptors of opioid. It is slowed down the gut, poor CNS penetration, low additive potential. 
it can lead to diarrhea and adverse effect like constipation and nausea. I will tell you a story about loperamide. By the way, loperamide is over the counter. But I will tell you a little story just for sake of your future guys and the sake that you might face such thing. I heard about one case here, like in Ukraine, about a person purchasing loperamide over the counter. And he was able to make it an actual opioid that penetrate the blood brain barrier. How? What do you think? How he converted loperamide into a drug of addiction. Basically, he injected loperamide in his body in a way that made it across the blood brain barrier. How? IV will not do it. It will not cross the blood brain barrier. This guy is smart. I don't know how he thought about it, but basically he did on himself a lumbar puncture. Okay? It was a stupid, actually, because he caused himself a staph aureus infection that moved over all over his spinal cord. But he did to himself a lumbar puncture and injected himself with this um, loperamide using, like, subarachnoid space, which crosses the blood-brain barrier. That's smart, but because he used an unsterile technique, he got multiple abscesses all over his spinal cord, which left him to have paralysis basically yep that's why he came to the hospital and that's why we even know about it okay so let's take a look about the next thing bacteria died done with that done with that done with this obviously it leads to constipation because well, well that's what it's all about yeah and the next thing we have is andon citron andon citron which is tron 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 it has a t so it works on the serotonin three receptor okay it works on the serotonin three receptor so it mostly act preferably and degrees vagal stimulation so there will be less vagus stimulation and it can act centrally so let's just speak about it for a second so it can act both in the periphery and in the center uh, central nervous system and it has a few function it has a potent anti-emetic function but before speaking about that, I want you to be comfortable with one story. If you get a question asking you, for a patient who's in chemotherapy, should we use undancitron or metaclobramide to decrease the vomiting? You need to choose undancitron. Let me explain why. What is the main site inside of the body where we have a production of the serotonin? Where is the most amount of serotonin is produced in our body? I hope you are thinking about the GIT. A lot of people think it's the brain. It's not the brain. It's the GIT, the one that makes the most amount of serotonin. So, in case of using chemotherapy, which cell will be destroyed first with chemotherapy? Which cell are the cell that going to destroy first? Okay. Yes, absolutely. So it's going to be the hair follicle, um, the the basically the skin, the crypts of the intestine. Why? Because they are a rapidly dividing cells. Yeah, rapidly dividing cells. So, yeah, absolutely. So when we are speaking about this one, take a look. Undan citron is um, inhibiting the what? It's inhibiting the serotonin. Well, I told you that the serotonin is produced by the enterocyte. So if I use chemotherapy, what will get, what will happen to the serotonin? Uh, uh, sorry, what will happen to the enterocyte? They will get destroyed. When I destroy the enterocyte, the serotonin is going to be released massively. Yes. I mean, there is a bag full with serotonin. If you destroy the bag, the serotonin will go out. So when the serotonin goes out, it's going to where? It will go to the brain. In the brain, there is a place called the fourth ventricle. Inside of the fourth ventricle, there is an area called area bostrima. Area bostrima. This is a concept I'm going to explain again in the brain and when we discuss the CNS. This area bostrima is the center of vomiting. So since it's center of vomiting, it makes the patient nauseous after chemotherapy because 
Serotonin was released in a massive amount from the destroyed enterocyte because of the chemotherapy. So, they write, Control vomiting post-operatively and in patient undergoing cancer chemotherapy. Okay. Can lead to headache, constipation, and the QT interval prolongation. If somebody has a long QT interval, he's at risk of what? What the problem is the patient at risk at in case of QT prolongation? Torsa de Bois. Yes. Torsa de Bois. So because of this Torsa de Bois, this patient can have also, uh, well, he can die because of the Torsa de Bois, but because of the destruction of the uh, serotonin, uh, the serotonin, uh, the cells containing the serotonin, the patient will be also at risk of serotonin syndrome. Okay? So the patient can also be at risk of serotonin syndrome. The next drug is called abribitant. Abribitant, the mechanism of this drug that it's a substance P antagonist. It's a substance P antagonist. Okay? So it can block the neurokinin 1 receptor, which is located in the brain. Okay? So neurokinin 1 receptor. Okay, it's also an antiemetic for chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting. We do use it, but for chemotherapy, we would like to use the indancitron much more often than this one. The next drug as an antiemetic, and the last antiemetic I'm going to speak about. So antiemetic, we spoke about one, two, and now three. So metaclopramide, we don't like to use it. It exists, but to be serious with you, we don't like it. It's a D2 receptor antagonist. So since it, it's a dopamine antagonist, which disease you would not like to use it in? Which disease it's a contraindication to use it in? Parkinson disease, absolutely, Parkinson disease. So in case of Parkinson disease, if you use such medication, it's going to have so many side effects that tremor is going to be uh, much more worse, yes? Um, so the next thing we have is metaclopramide, D2 receptor antagonist, increased resting tone and contractility. Also, it can lead to lower esophageal sphincter, change in the tone. Also, motility, which makes basically more peristalsis. If you have more peristalsis, you are going to get the D word, diarrhea. Also promotes gastric emptying, which is really important thing, especially in somebody who have gastroparesis. Who gets gastroparesis? Well, first of all, gastroparesis is a paralysis of the stomach, and it's mainly happening in patient with diabetes mellitus. It can be due to ileus, you are correct, which is post-surgical ileus, but for post-surgical ileus, we like to use muscarinic agonist, which is a little bit different. Okay. So the adverse effect, um, so yeah, the right here, sorry, does not influence the colonic transport time, only the stomach and the upper intestine. So diabetes and both operative gastroparesis, but still, to be totally truthful with you, the drug of choice is what? Muscarinic agonist, okay? Why? They tend to ha have less side effects than metoclopramide. Guys, Take a look at the side effects. The paragraph of the side effects is longer for the paragraph for the clinical use. So we don't like it that much. Also persistent GERD. You can give metoclopramide because it just promote gastric emptying, which reduces the amount of acid in the stomach. Increase Parkinson is, uh, Parkinson, uh, Parkinson symptoms. Tardive dyskinesia, which I want you actually to know what does it mean. People who use antipsychotics, guys. These patients can have like this problem in the movement of their mouth. So you, you notice it also a lot in old people. Ah, notice this lady. Can you see it? This weird movement of the mouth. They can put their tongue outside of their head. Can you see this thing? This is start of dyskinesia. They can be like, mm, 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 do something like that. Okay. They don't notice that they are doing it, by the way. 
See, he's like showing. He's showing. Yep, also a lot of old people do it, yeah? They don't notice it. They don't notice it. So always distract them with something and notice their faces. Tell them, raise your hand in front of you and look at their face, okay? So when you distract them, you can see it much more evident. Okay, so restlessness, drowsiness, fatigue and depression and diarrhea. All of these can be symptoms. Why the depression? Because it inhibits the dopamine, the hormone of happiness. So the drug interaction with the goxin and diabetic agent. Okay, so that's a, that's a problem. Contraindication in patient with a small bowel obstruction. Why? If you have an obstruction, would you like to have peristalsis? If you have an obstruction, should you have peristalsis? The answer is no, it can lead to colicky pain. Yes, absolutely, got, right, good. So contraindication in patient with a small bowel obstruction and Parkinson's disease because they block the D2 receptor, which is going to worsening the symptoms, okay? Good. So they also decrease the seizure threshold. Okay. Decrease the seizure threshold. Nice. So it's a bad idea to give it to patients who already have seizures. So the next drug is Orelostat. It's for people who want to lose weight. But we don't like it again. Why? Because the clinical use is weight loss. But the side effects is a long side effects. Actually, it's not that bad, the side effects. There is a couple of things that are bad, but overall, it's not that bad. Back in the 90s, I forgot the name of this chips. There was a chips in the US that was really famous, and people used to eat it, and they used to lose weight, okay? That chips was stopped after that. Why? Because they discovered that these people used to mix their chips with a real estate, okay? Maybe our friend from the U.S. here can tell us what is the name of the chips because I truly forgot about its name. Uh, but it's people who used to consume it back in the 90s. They used to get really bad diarrhea. Uh, and that's why they stopped its production because they faked the patient by telling them it's low calories. But it was not low calories. It basically had oral stat in it. So it inhibits the gastric and pancreatic lipase, which decreases the breakdown and the absorption of dietary fat. That means all of the fat are going to go into the feces. Taking with fat containing meals. So that can lead to weight loss. So the adverse effect is abdominal pain, obviously, bloatliness, bowel urgency and the frequency. Why? Because they are getting all of the fat out. And steatorrhea. Decrease absorption of fat soluble vitamin as, uh, uh, as well, which are, what are the fat soluble vitamin, please? Nice. Okay. So yeah, if you are thinking about taking a real stat, think again. Why? Because it can lead to fat soluble vitamin deficiency. Okay. Really quick. Can fat soluble vitamin lead to toxicity if you take so much of them? The answer is yes. So fat soluble vitamin If you take a lot of them, they can lead to toxicity. What about water soluble? The answer is no. They cannot lead to toxicity except one, niacin. Why they cannot lead to toxicity? Because if you have too much of them, they will just go to the urine, except one. Niacin can be toxic. It's the only one. The other B1, B2, B6, B12, they cannot be toxic. Only niacin can be toxic. Because the other Bs, if you have so much of them, they can simply go to the urine and get excreted out of the body. Let's just speak about laxatives now. Laxatives are a drug that help you to boob, yeah? So indicative for constipation or patient on opioid requiring bowel regime. So we have something called bulk forming laxative, osmotic laxative, stimulants, and emollients. So these are important because as the physician, you need to know where, when to prescribe which one, you know, all of them work, but when I should prescribe this one, when should I prescribe this one? How should I suspect that my patient secretly taking that one? Bulk forming laxatives. 
These laxatives are like uh, psyllium and uh, methyl cellulose. Basically, when they you take them, you, you ingest them inside of you. This is the intestine. So this is these bulk forming laxatives. Okay. And what they do, they draw, draw water from the walls of the intestine into the intestine themselves which is going to make the feces much more larger yeah so when they make the feces much more larger this is going to stretch the intestine when your intestine is stretched it will start to peristalse when it starts to peristalse it's going to move the feces forward which basically lead to diarrhea yeah so they write soluble fibers that draw water into the gut lumen, forming viscous liquid that promote peristalsis. A problem of it is bloating. Osmotic laxatives. Let's just speak about this osmotic laxative. Again, the same int intestine. Okay. They have a pretty similar function. Okay. The only difference that the bulk forming laxative are fibers. These osmotic laxatives are not fibers. So we have magnesium hydroxide. I told you, you are an MD. And does anybody remember MD? Magnesium lead to diarrhea. Which drug led to constipation? Which drug was it? Aluminium. Absolutely. Okay. Magnesium citrate and polyethyl uh, glycol and lacrulose as well. All of these are osmotic, the same idea. So these will come here and they are going to suck the water inside of the lumen of the GI. The only difference, the, the first group was fibers. Here, they are not fibers. So they write, there is one drug that is super important called lactulose, which is used to treat hepatic encephalopathy. Can somebody remind me why we get even hepatic encephalopathy? Why do we get hepatic encephalopathy? Increase ammonia because of failure of what metabolic process? Urea cycle, absolutely. So we can use lactulose to treat hepatic encephalopathy. Why? Because the gut flora degrades the lactulose into its metabolite, lactic acid and acetic acid, which eventually promote the excretion of NH4. Um, so it kicks the ammonia and converts it into something called ammonium. Okay, ammonia beco becomes ammonium. And that ammonium goes like outside of the body with the feces, which decreases the amount of ammonia from the body. So the adverse effect, again, diarrhea, dehydration, because they take a lot of water, may, oh, yes, may be misused by patient with bulimia nervosa. Why? Because patient with bulimia nervosa, he eats something, he feels, oh my God, I'm fat. So he want to induce vomiting or induce diarrhea to lose weight quickly. Or they even sometimes use diuretic to lose weight quickly. Overuse may lead to metabolic alkalosis. Why? Because feces are full with which substances? Which substance is full uh, is, is, uh, is in the feces? Bicarbonate. Bicarbonate. So... The bicarbonate loss will lead to metabolic alkalosis. Nice. So the next drug is a stimulant, which is Senai, also known as Bisoc uh, and also one other drug called Bisocodil, really commonly used these days. So they are just stimulant of the enteric nervous system. And that will lead to colonic contraction, promoting the peristalsis, which can lead to diarrhea. And uh, overuse can lead to metabolic alkalosis as well. All of them overuse can lead to metabolic alkalosis, by the way, because the diarrhea contains uh, bicarbonate. That's why it will lead to metabolic alkalosis. But also it can lead to melanosis coli. It's a benign condition, but you need to recognize it because it looks really scary. Okay. Melanosis coli is a benign condition that can occur in the colon if you overuse senna. Yes, which are the stimulant of the enteric nervous system so you can see the colon is quite black and that's because the use of senna basically they will have a plenty of lipofusion inside of the walls because of lipid peroxidation a process you do not have to know about but you need to recognize the picture of it 
when you see a colon black from the inside, think this patient probably um, like abusing this medication. Yes? Okay. So the next one is emolin, like decussiate. So it promotes incorporation of water and fat, not only water, now and fat into the stools. This used to promote water. Now we are promoting fat. So it can lead to diarrhea, fat soluble vitamin deficiency, and metabolic alkalosis. Okay, that's it for the laxatives. So the most important thing about laxative is to know, one, uh, the mechanism, how each of them work, two, the side effects, especially about the metabolic alkalosis thing. They do give you the BH, they do give you the bicarb, which should be low, and they do ask you about the compensation, which is, will be respiratory acidosis by increasing the BCO2, okay? So that's it for GIT. We are done with one more system. Congratulations. Uh, so, so far we finished, uh, oh, sorry. Okay, so far we finished this guy, this guy, and this guy. We also finished uh, immunology, microbiology, and pathology. We finished the chapter of biochemistry, which is the molecular, and uh, we will finish the cellular soon as well. And um, yeah, so currently, according to the bull, I just checked it. Uh, I, I saw that you guys want to do endocrinology and biochem. So today we are going to speak about the first two pages of the, uh, basically the um, endocrinology, in which we are going to discuss embryology and anatomy. And then I will let you free because I know it's a Friday night and most of you have some plans. For now, let's take just a quick eight minutes break and I will see you in the eight minutes. Come back to do two pages and call it off. See you in eight minutes. So let's just start this new system. We'll just be explaining a couple of pages. And uh, it goes something like this. So the thyroid development. You need to know where does the thyroid comes from? Actually, um, the thyroid, it comes from something called the thyroid diverticulum, okay? This thyroid diverticulum comes from the primitive pharynx and descends into the neck. So it comes from the pharynx, which is up here, and then it descends like this until it reaches its place. Okay, so it's connected to the tongue using this guy, the thyroglossal duct which normally disappears, and if it persists, it can lead to formation of a cyst or the pyramidal lobe of the thyroid. Okay, what is the pyramidal lobe of the thyroid? Take a look at an anterior view here. This is the thyroglossal duct. There is sometimes, uh, it should not, first of all, you should not have it, okay? Instead of that, you should have here something called the pyramidal portion of the thyroid gland. But sometimes it gets obliterated from here, this duct, obliterated from here, but it forms a cyst. Okay, so how can I know that this cyst is like a cyst from the thyroglossal duct? Well, you tell the patient to swallow. Give him some water, tell him to swallow it. If it moves up and down, it's a thyroid cyst, well, thyroglossal cyst. If it does not move and up, up and down, it's something else. Okay? So... They write, it's connected to the tongue by the thyroglossal duct, which normally disappears and but may persist as a cyst or a pyramidal lobe of the thyroid. For amen cecum, cecum means blind, is a normal remnant of the thyroglossal duct. Most common ectopic thyroid tissue site is the tongue, which is something called lingual thyroid. For example, they can tell you, yes. They can tell you about a patient who had a thyroidectomy and they ask you, can this patient have thyroid cancer after a, th a total thyroidectomy? The answer is yes. If he had an ectopic thyroid tissue, which can be existing inside of the mouth. Yes, near the foramen cecum. Okay. Yeah, lingual thyroid, it can be here, it can be here, or it even can be here. So, let me send you this.
So the next thing that they say, uh, removal may result in hypothyroidism if it was the only thyroid tissue present. Sometimes patient uh, comes to you complaining of that mass. They think it's cancer, so you remove it for them. They end up with hypothyroidism. The reason is that that, well, oral type of thyroid tissue is actually functional. Thyroglossus ductus presents as an anterior midline mass that moves when swallowing or when you protrude your, uh, your tongue. This is important because that helps to differentiate it between it and something called persistent cervical sinus, which can lead to pharyngeal cleft cyst, okay, which exists in the lateral neck. And that one, in case of a swallowing, it will not move. So if it will not move, it's not thyroid. Thyroid follicular cells are derived from endoderm because after all, they are epithelial tissue. Parafollicular cells arises from the fourth parapharyngeal, uh, sorry, fourth pharyngeal pouch. And they, they are also, we have something called the follicular cells make the thyroid hormone. Parafollicular cells make, what do they make? Calcitonin. Yes. And uh, you did not study this yet, but calcitonin and the tumor of these cells, we call it a medullary thyroid tumor, which will be associated with something called Rett syndrome. Okay. Sorry, not red. Red mutation, not red syndrome. So the pituitary gland. Okay. Speaking about the pituitary gland, can somebody tell me, please, regarding the pituitary gland, um, from which portion of the brain does it come from? Is it the telencephalon, the encephalon, rhombencephalon, or metencephalon? Well, actually, it's the deencephalon. So the deencephalon, we did not do this yet, but it's here. Ah, oh, sorry. Okay, here it is. So the deencephalon can give the thalamus and the hypothalamus. From the hypothalamus, under it, if we draw it, we have the hypothalamus like this. It have the posterior and the anterior pituitary. The posterior pituitary comes from the hypothalamus, so it's a brain tissue. The anterior pituitary comes from the mouth, okay? From something called the racket's pouch, okay? So it is coming from the mouth, oral ectoderm. So when we go to endocrinology and we take a look about the pituitary, we have two portions of it, something called the anterior pituitary and something called the posterior pituitary. The anterior pituitary is also known as the adenohypophysis. The neurohypophysis is known as the posterior pituitary. Anterior pituitary makes so many hormones, FSH, LS, LH, TSH, ACTH, prolactin, growth hormone, beta endorphin. So many of them will learn, will learn each of them individually. Also, MSH, which is secreted from the intermittent lobe of the pituitary, which is between the anterior and the posterior. All of the anterior pituitary is derived from the oral ectoderm, also known as the red keys pouch, and it has two subunits, I mean the hormones. So the hormones, all of these guys have two subunits, an alpha subunit and a beta subunit. The alpha subunit basically it's shared and common between so many types of hormones, like TSH, LH, FSH, and HCG. Why this is important? Because if we say some disease, like um, some type, I did not study this yet, but there is something called molar pregnancy, or, okay, that's good. Um, what does CC mean? Yep, choriocarcinoma. So that will lead to a humongous amount of uh, beta HCG, which eventually can lead to TSH-like symptoms. Why? Because they have the similar subunit, which means they can activate the TSH receptor and lead to hyperthyroidism. Beta subunit determine the exact speciality of these hormones. 
Proobium melanocortin derivatives. So there is something that is big structure that can give so many things. So proobio, obio, so it makes the beta endorphin. Melano, so it makes the melanin, MSH, melanin stimulating hormone. Cortin, so it makes the ACTH, adenocorticotropic hormone. Okay? So some hormones are produced from the basophils, which is a type of cells, and acidophil. So the basophils will be the flat, FSH, LS, ACTH, and TSH. Personally, I never memorized them. I only memorized the acidophil, which were the prolactin and the growth hormone. Now we are just speaking about like we are covering anatomy, which is plenty of stuff. When we describe the physiology of them, you will be able to memorize them much more easy because we'll be speaking about each of them at a time. Posterior pituitary, this is always a tricky question. Where is ADH produced? Where do we produce antidiuretic hormone? Well, the answer will be the hypothalamus. And it's released from the posterior pituitary. So stored and <clears throat> so posterior pituitary it stores and releases the vasopressin, also known as antidiuretic hormone, and oxytocin. Both are made in the hypothalamus, in the supraoptic and the paraventricular nuclei, and they move down using a neuron system, which basically has the neuron body in the hypothalamus. Then he has an axon reaching the posterior pituitary. And then the posterior pituitary, it releases its hormone, like the oxytocin and the vasopressin. Okay, so it's um, they write using a carrier protein known as kinesin. Kinesin. It's derived from neuroectoderm. Okay. Adrenal cortex, uh, adrenal cortex and medulla. Well, the adrenal gland is located above the kidney. My first question is, which color it is? Well, guys, it's actually yellow. Okay. Why do you think it's yellow? The adrenal gland, I mean. Well, the reason is that a lot of steroid hormone in it and all of the steroid hormone are made out of cholesterol and cholesterol is yellow okay so adrenal cortex and medulla the adrenal cortex is derived from mesoderm and the medulla is derived from neuronal cross cells so it's it is stained for s100 positive the neuronal cross cells so the medulla stains for s100 positive and here they mention the different layers of it, histological structure, and which hormone does, do they get out. So here is the cortex and here is the medulla. So from the cortex, we have the GFR, glomerulosa fasciculata reticularis, and the hormone, and, and what does that mean? Here you can see glomeruli, glomeruli-like structure, fascicle, which means robe-like structure, and reticularis, which means net-like structure, okay? So they are regulated by the following, uh, sorry, before regulation, which hormone do they produce? The deeper you go, the sweeter it gets. So first of all, we have mineral neocorticoid, then glycocorticoid, which is more sweet. Finally, androgens. Androgens are sex hormones, so that's the sweetest. So the most common type of mineral neocorticoid will be aldosterone, most common type of the glycocorticoids will be cortisol, and androgens, it will be the dahiya. Not the hiyas, not with an S, that's different. So they are regulated, the aldosterone, by the RAS system, so the angiotensin 2. The cortisol by the, um, we call it the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, so ACTH and corticotropin releasing hormone. The same with the androgens. While the chromaffin cells is producing catecholamines and they can have a cancer called pheochromocytoma, which will release catecholamines. Catecholamines include epinephrine and norepinephrine. It's regulated by the preganglionic sympathetic fibers, okay? But this is important. The preganglionic sympathetic fibers, I know it's sympathetic, 
but it will have acetylcholine. It's a rare event, that's why it's important. So the preganglionic sympathetic fiber work using acetylcholine. Only in this case. Okay, so GFR corresponds with salt, sugar, and sex. The deeper you get, the sweeter it gets. Mineralocorticosteroid, glycocorticoids, and androgens. Endocrine pancreas cell types. So when you take a look at a pancreas, pancreas has an endocrinological function and an exocrinological function. The exocrinological function with the protease, lipase, and all of this stuff, we spoke about it in GIT. Now we, it's time to speak about the endocrinological function. So the endocrinological function of the pancreas is as follows. We have something called the islet of Langerhans are a collection of alpha and beta cells and also the delta cells. So they are as follow. The alpha cells, which is the produces the glucagon, are mostly on the periphery. Notice, this is the islet, okay, of Langerhans. So the alpha cells are mostly on the periphery, while the beta cells are uh, secrete insulin and they are more central. And the somatostatin producing cells, which is also known as the delta cells, are all over the place. Remember, the somatostatin function was to inhibit everything. Anybody remember what was the analog of somatostatin? The analog of somatostatin. Yeah, it inhibits everything else, doctor. Uh, it comes from the D cells. But uh, uh, analog, I mean, which drug works like somatostatin? Somatotropin is the opposite of somatostatin. Somatotropin is an an, uh, it's analog, which means it looks like um, um, somatotropin. So when I say an analog to somatotropin, it means it looks like somatotropin. Somatotropin is a growth factor. Somatostatin is an anti-growth factor. Okay? So, oh, nice. So the, actually, the drug that works exactly like somatostatin is octeriotide, guys. Do not forget about that. It's octeriotide. Okay, good. So today we did one page from biochemistry, two pages from endocrinology, and we did, I believe, uh, three and a half pages from uh, uh, GIT. So the sum of that will be six and a half pages, which is not bad. So I will continue with you guys tomorrow. Um, have fun. It's a Friday night. And I will see you guys tomorrow. Bye-bye, everybody.